I never redo anything and I already redone it once and I'm like, no, this sucks. And I was talking to somebody, I'm like, after the show, I'm taking this to work, I'm putting it in a four corner press and I'm freaking crunching it. <laughs> As I'm saying this, this guy walks up, he's like, I'll give you $600 for that. And I'm, I almost didn't want to sell it to him. I was so like, oh, okay, here you go. You didn't I, want it to live. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by the FMA Annual Meeting. The industry's largest networking event heads to Las Vegas February 28th through March 2nd. It's your opportunity to connect with executives and leaders in metal fabrication, steel production and distribution, service centers, and so much more. Hear from experts on trending industry topics and the insights you need to drive decisions. And remember, what happens in Vegas takes your business further. Register today for the 2023 FMA Annual Meeting at fmamfg.org. What was that again? That's fmamfg.org. All right, welcome to today's episode of the Fabricator Podcast. Joined by Jim Gorzik. Hello. Uh, Dan Davis, editor in chief of the Fabricator magazine. Also joined by, go ahead, Gareth. Gareth Slager. Or, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that guy. I'm trying to produce this crazy <laughs> there you craziness. Go. So we uh we're doing an intro for today's episode with uh guest host Josh Welton. This was taken at 2022 Fabtech. But he's joined with some really in- by uh really interesting guys, uh, Luis Varello Rico. Uh, Ivan Eiler and Frank Ledbetter. Yeah, uh, all these guys are on Metal Masters. Yeah, Netflix show. Yeah, and I metal think, working, metal fabrication competition show. Yes. Also artwork. It was kind of it kind it of had way identity cooler, crisis. Way cooler than Chopped <laughs> on Food Network. Yeah. Oh, well. And uh, much more dangerous. Different material too. Yeah. No. No secret baskets. Yeah, it was kind uh, of an impromptu episode. They were all outside I, our podcast booth just chatting. I was like, well. Might as well get this on camera. Well, uh, it was an interesting yeah. conversation. Yeah, they yeah. spend a lot of time yeah. talking about like advanced technology and how they incorporate it, but you know, at the same time, they want to balance like what they're dedicated to, which got me to thinking with all the like artificial intelligence intelligence stuff you're starting to see like actually make its way to the internet. Yeah. And you know, the one thing we were just chatting with, about before we came on was right. AI that was used to create a Family Guy sitcom. That looks incredibly, I mean, probably a mix between like DreamWorks and (laughs) and, it's terrifying. It's it's a little terrifying, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And just in terms of nowhere else but in this country could AI be like making its like debut and people being using it to to create stuff like this. Well, someone (laughs) went into the some AI generator and said, "We want to see." Family Guy depicted as a an eighty sitcom. So, if you're watching this, you can see someone did that, and it's the Family Matters kind of theme and look to it. But all the Family or Family Guy up characters are almost human like, almost human like. Yeah, Peter's very <laughs> large yeah, to just... the point where you almost doubt someone could like really exist at that size on a regular basis and hold old job. Of all these characters, I'd say Quagmire probably doesn't look like the one that you would. <laughs> <laughs> my my depth of knowledge on Family Guy is only related to memes that my son sends me. So, yeah, I, I feel like somewhere along the lines, I I pretty much dedicated myself to like Simpsons, and I'm like, you know what? I'm just not gonna kind of kind of fall for it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. The whole conversation was about how technology is infiltrating art, and you know, is is AI making it more so more or less, more or less, you know, is it bastardizing the concept of art or is it just something we have to deal with? So in one of the points they make is that maybe with the rise of AI influenced art, it just makes their works, which are more hands on. And I guess that would apply to other uh, artists as well, more valuable. Right. Right. I'm not so sure. I can't tell you of the, of the art I own, I'm not sure I who painted the dogs playing poker print, but you know I, I'm not I'm not exactly there. Xerox, right? yeah. And when yeah. you're buying art for like fifty dollars a pop at like mm-hmm. some type of local art fair, yeah. I mean I don't know. I hope to get to the point where I can invest, perhaps. 
but uh, I'm not there yet. So they, this whole conversation got me to wondering, if you were younger, would you actually use this technology like to help you out maybe in, uh, say, school situations? Well, it was interesting. One of the comments that they made or you'll, you'll hear coming up in the podcast is how they were able to scale certain projects based on the availability of technology. So really what you're asking is if you have five papers due and it's Monday night, yeah, so so and I they're due Tuesday morning. I follow a couple like academics on Twitter, and they're like playing around with it, and they're like they're giving it props. Like, yeah, this might slide by if I'm not like totally in tune with what the student can or cannot produce. Yeah, there's uh, an AI generator for everything now. You can there's like an AI generator. You can say, write me a Smashing Pumpkin song, right? And like in <laughs> less than a minute, you'll just have lyrics in a song that be a Smashing Pumpkin song. <laughs> yeah yeah i might i don't know if i'd choose to do that but sure i don't know i mean as long people, as billy corgan's roaming the earth do we really want to yeah. steal his thunder you don't want to steal anything from billy corgan <laughs> no, yeah. right. yeah. uh so i mean the other end of that though is you know frank ledbetter was involved in that conversation and he's pretty much just like hammer and yeah yeah know, he's old school yeah, said, yeah. but that kind of got me thinking of there's this argentinian a uh, metal sculptor that came across on Instagram uh, <laughs> who does all this like cool kinetic, like small sculpture stuff. You can, if you look on, mm -hmm. uh, if you're cool. watching this, you can see we're showing a video of he made this movable like rock sculpture. Yeah, rock rock yeah. Mallets. Yeah. yeah, big metal mallets or small metal mallets that you can push and pull and on a pulley system and crash a, smash a. a so I'm not going to lie to you, the, the, at the rate of like, new outdoor beer related activities. Yeah. It you know, that might fall into one. I'm I'm yeah. betting I might show up to someone's backyard this summer and see that. Yeah. Maybe in Buffalo. <laughs> where it's got the you know, the table. And they just jump right through it. Yeah, I know. He just he takes all this old scrap metal and creates these cool little uh like kinetic sculptures. Yeah, I, I uh, the one that got me is one that held a steak knife and it was very yeah. is very good at thrusting forward. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I the dogs the, are also very solid. Go, the, dear AI machine, please create me <laughs> a murder mystery around a kinetic sculpture with a steak knife. <laughs> yeah, his his name's Guillermo Galetti, based out of Argentina. It's summer down in uh, Argentina right now. For mm -hmm. those of you keeping score at home. Yeah. And they're doing pull ups. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. sorts of cool stuff. Yeah. That's but awesome. that's you know. what you get with creativity, real yeah. creativity. There you go. So, uh, why don't we uh, jump over to the podcast and like let, let's listen to the people that actually create the art instead of the nim nuts talking <laughs> about the art? <laughs> talking about smashing pumpkin songs. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> Billy Peter Corgan Griffin. hold on, hold and, on uh, line too. We'll, we'll, we think you'll enjoy this. And a special, I wanted to give a special shout out to Frank Ledbetter, who's done some outdoor mm -hmm. art for my, my peeps in Kenner, Louisiana. Where you at, Kenner, bra? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Enjoy. The Fabricator Podcast is presented by Nuts, Bolts, and Thingamajigs. As the foundation of the Fabricators and Manufacturers Association, NBT is helping the next generation discover their future across the country in manufacturing through hands-on camps and scholarship programs. You can invest in tomorrow's workforce by visiting nutsandboltsfoundation.org. One more time, nuts and, and bolts foundation dot org. org. We're here in the fab, uh, the fabricator booth, uh, doing a impromptu podcast. I've got Frank and Louis here. Um, they were both on uh, Metal Shop Masters, but we've just been talking about design and fabrication and and kind of how it impacts art. Um, like, what kind of a tricky subject? We were just talking about AI, like AI engineering, um, which is super cool. And then you see AI generated art. And it's kind of a sticky situation. Like, where do you think, where do you think the next generation of artists is going to go as far as like their go-to toolbox? Um, I mean, just art and, and specifically art, I think we're going towards um, the name of that new stuff that they're doing. Which? Uh, it's all like, uh, like Bitcoin stuff, the Bitcoin art. 
Oh, oh, that uh, NFTs. NFTs. Yeah. NFTs are huge, and I think a lot of the younger crowd uh, really appreciate that. I also think that there is a degree of lack of investment in terms of like learn, needing to learn how to do things right. that is really appealing to that generation. Yeah, I get that. Which is kind of, I, I don't feel great about. Like, I wish, you know, people would learn how to, like, you know, use a press break or learn how to weld or whatever before they just say that they can become an artist. But I think they're, ultimately, I feel like they're, you have to give way for whatever is happening with the youth and whatever they're into. Like, that's just, that's who's going to be driving, you know, the path. So it is tricky. I always looked at uh, Matisse as one of my favorite artists, and a lot of his well known pieces are just like, one or two lines mm -hmm. and somebody will look at that that's an experience and be like well i can do that right it's like yeah but you don't he learned the classical way he was he was traditionally trained and then became a master to the point where he could eliminate everything but those two lines right. and where they were and a lot of people want to skip that step of learning and just go straight to the like well i want to just you know paint a couple lines and make yeah. a masterpiece the other part is being an originator, uh, so Paul Pollock, for, for for instance, he just did all that, that splattery and painting, yep. and like everyone's like, yeah, I can do that. But well, first of all, you weren't the first person you to do it. You didn't do it, and and he did it like in a, in a, in a time where he like he was breaking all the rules. So there's like, yeah, can you do it? But it's also a, a place and time. About place and time, absolutely. For sure. Yeah. For sure. So, how do you feel about about? where the direction that art is going you, you know me i'm old school <laughs> i'm always going to be totally old school. so I, i'm really you know i'm torn you know about the ai stuff and uh i know lou and i've worked together you know he's helped me you know because of this knowledge you know and and being able to do things on a computer so uh i mean there's definitely you know some value in technology uh but it is a sticky wicket, you yeah. know. But I think it'll work itself out. Like you, like you said earlier, you know, maybe it'll increase the value of those that, you know, yeah. that do it the old way or whatever, you know. Yeah, I was quoting uh, Alex Roy who had said, um, the more AI art that's created, the more valuable human art becomes. And the yeah. people who have those... That, 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 that background in the old school way of doing things, like there's always going to be value... And that because it's kind of it becomes the basis of everything going forward. Like, yeah. Even AI stuff is based on, you know, learning from our past, really. Yeah. Right. Well, like you said, there's a connection. I mean, to to sell art, uh, you know, a couple things gotta be in place. Somebody number one, they gotta have a connection to what you do. Yep. And a connection to you, you know, because you're that's you. I Just mean, like we were talking earlier, yeah, you, they're buying the artist as much as they're buying the yeah, art. Yeah, you create something and they, you know, and then, you know, if they have the disposable income, they're going to buy it, yep. you know. So it's... Um, yeah, there's something about having that connection with, with another organic being that is creating this thing that you're agreeing that, okay, this is fantastic, I need to have this. Right. As opposed to, um, I mean, you're just n not going to have that connection with the machine. I mean, like I said, it's a it's a valuable tool, but it's it's not a human. I mean, it's not, you know, uh, but but that person create using that technology to create, like you said, it goes back to connecting with that person, right? And how they present it, you know. Yeah, uh, totally. I think the, another very exciting front in art is going back to the NFT kind of stuff is the augmented reality that they're that they're projecting over like physical pieces of work whether it's a painting and you hold your phone up and now the painting comes alive and yeah, starts yeah. to swirl or whatever some of uh, that stuff's super cool yeah, interactive. I think, like i saw that and i was like okay that would be like my gateway drug into like doing nfts because i have you know plenty of physical uh sculptures out in the world that maybe i could assign like a three-dimensional like after effect and augment augmented reality so totally I think, you know, and it comes back down to like using technology and, and making, you know, things out of metal or all this new tooling. And it's like you, you're either you're either just like OK with being stagnant and like doing it the old school way, which there's nothing wrong with that. But you, you, you it's there's so much new technology that makes things so, so much more efficient. It's like, I don't know, I, I feel like I, I would love to learn all that stuff and, and, and find new ways to use that type of technology to it, make interesting things. And it can expand your potential. Like it, you, you, you know, whether it's your mind or your physical, mm -hmm. but like even from a standpoint of just physically breaking down and allowing other, like whether it's a, whether it's a helper tool or you get to yeah. the point where you're using a cobot to help you do yeah. stuff, like you're still in charge 
maybe you just physically don't have the means to means to make that happen, yeah. but your mind is still there. I think that the easiest and probably the most important change that I realized by using technology is scale. Like I can I can use scale now. Like I can make something as big as I want it now because I'm able to to problem solve uh, digitally in CAD. So before, like if you asked me to make a 19 foot tall hand holding a baseball, which I've done, like. I wouldn't even know where to start like right. without without the technology like I could do drawings but it helps tremendously for sure and it, and it opens up you know different arenas of, of of customers and different things that you can do like massively so yeah right on uh, super cool hi Ivan hi Ivan how, how are you, you Ivan sir <laughs> I hope I can hear you over there I hope I can hear you over there as well <laughs> I'm catching little bits of it. <laughs> right on. Uh, we were just talking about like art and AI and kind of this intersection that's happening and where we go from here. Like how much of it do we, how much of it do we just like bring into the fold and how much of it is still like a little sketchy and like where the future goes with man and machine creating. Yeah, as, as much as you want. Yeah. I mean, literally, as the artist, whatever tools you're using, use them. Whatever you like to do that creates how you create it, do it. If something comes along that changes that, do that. I mean... Once upon a time, there was probably somebody who got mad at somebody who wasn't torch welding because they were using this newfangled electricity. Oh, oh for sure it. that happened. Yeah, of course. So it doesn't really matter. There's always going to be new technology. There's always yep. going to be things that move you forward. And if they move you forward as an artist, embrace it. I yeah. see that. It, even So we're at Fabtech, and this show in particular, this year, there's a ton of automation. And I've always been like pro-human and anti-robot but i'm starting to change my i'm starting to change my ways a little bit and i think a big part of that is like throughout history like when when the automotive industry in detroit really started using the the assembly line everyone thought it was going to kill the kill the trades kill the craftsmen yeah, sure. and to an extent you know there was some of that but it also created opportunities and created jobs and like this is inevitable we have to kind of get on board at some point and be like okay if this is happening, how can we shape how this happens or how can we have it, you know, work in our world and how we think of things? Yeah. And all those things. I mean, again, it's just. I mean, there's, there's really nothing, there's nothing wrong with embracing technology, whether you're an artist or a manufacturer. Obviously, it makes a lot more sense, you know, from a manufacturing standpoint, because it's all about making a dollar. But for somebody to say that somebody's art is better than somebody else's simply because it's made a different way, that's like it's a very like. Luddite way of thinking, you know? Yeah. Like, you can't, you know, I mean, I don't know. To me, I say whatever you use to do your art is just part of your art, and that's fine, and there's nothing wrong with that. I've always, I, one of the issues I've always had is when people are like, oh, you're a metal artist. It's like, no, yeah. I'm an artist. I just, metal's one of the <laughs> mediums sure, I use, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. There's definitely that, that uh, either, I don't know if you want to call it a hierarchy or like this segment, uh, the segregation of these different things, but it's mm. like, and you use, use what you can use to create, really, yeah. you know? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, if somebody that uses computers, it doesn't mean they can't do it by hand. It just means they like doing it this certain way or like taking and, you know, having whatever they're having to, to do that. And I mean, for That's someone, their creative outlet. That's what they yeah, know, yeah. Or it might even just be something just to help along the way. Like, it's a lot different between me and Luis, but for me, like, I use CNC plasma cutter, yeah. you know? And it's like, yeah, I could sit here and cut a thousand of the same leaf, but like, what was the point? What's be? the point? Yeah, I'm literally going to be doing the same thing whether I do it yeah. by hand or with the just machine. showing off that I can do this it's a thousand just, times yeah. in a row. Yeah, like, yeah it's just, yeah. just going to save me a week of sitting there and hand and cutting totally. by hand. Yeah, but for Luis, like the stuff that he does with a computer is like outstanding. It's out of this world, and he's even helped, you know, me, Frank. He's helped a ton of other artists that he's met along the way just because it's like there's things I want to do, but I need the knowledge that you have and the artistic ability that you have to help me do what I want to do because it's going to take this or that. That's awesome. And Ivan's obviously an amazing artist, and, but he doesn't need, he's not needed any of that to, to get where he's at. And we're standing in the same room. Um, but for instance, uh, I'm, so I'm restoring a 69 C10. I brought it all the way down to, I got it sandblasted and everything. And I'm doing a lot of uh, uh, rust repair. I'm using all the technology that I have and learning new technology to make uh, panels that I can't get, you know, aftermarket. For instance, I'm using a 3D scanner on my phone to scan parts that I'm trying to recreate, import them into CAD, and then making them into flat files that I can cut on my CNC and then fold on my brake. Um, obviously, you can make that out of a template, but 
since I have all these things and I'm pretty efficient at doing them, like I can probably do it just as fast or sometimes faster than actually making a paper template. Uh, it just kind of goes back to that thing, you know, there's more There's more than one way to skin a cat. Yeah, for so. sure, for sure. Oh, that's super cool. So is, is it like uh, like the LiDAR are you using? Yeah, this, I, I specifically bought this cell phone because it has LiDAR. Right on. And it's it's insane. I got I to gotta experiment with that. Yeah, I think I have that on my, on my phone. Yeah. That's that's super cool. So, I've heard architects are using it a lot, designers are using it a lot to capture the rooms they're in. Yep. So and, when I go to, for instance, I got someone that wants me to make a, like a handrail for this pretty large property. So instead of taking, we're talking like, like, I don't know, like 150 feet of, of rail that wraps around a corner. I, instead of taking a tape, I just took the LiDAR and I walked the job and now I can import it into CAD and then just do yeah. whatever I want to do. That's so dope. Yeah, so and it's just super fast. Uh, so that's that's one way to use it. But like, for instance, I scanned Frank's head the other day and I, so I have like a full <laughs> scan of Frank's head. Yes. And if I wanted to do that layered kind of style that I've done yep, before, yep. I, I could stack out Frank's head and make it eight foot tall if I wanted it out of steel or, I mean, there's a ton of ways to do it. And like I said, now I'm using it to reproduce, reproduce parts. And this goes back to my point. Um, if you're interested in learning, and I think that's incredibly important, it doesn't matter if you're a welder, fabricator, or an artist, like is if you're a human and you're interested in learning, there's just so many cool things out there to, 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 to get into. And, and the more you know, like the, 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 the more interesting your path in life just begin, becomes because you're just like, you end up meeting a bunch of cool people just because you have these like really unique, you, all these skills that you clump together that make you who you are. Totally. And you, you end up meeting like really interesting people and like finding really cool projects to work on. I so. totally get that. And like in the past, we had like, we were so isolated in these little niches and these little packs, so whether it was across the country or across the world. And I, I, that's one of the great things that social media has done is, is a, it's brought uh, awareness to all these different styles and techniques from things like when I first started, like when social media first popped off, I would always get like, oh, you, there's no way you welded that. A machine had to weld that. I've been welding for 40 years. and I've, <laughs> It's because this person has been doing the same weld for 40 years and they didn't have, uh, you know, not that social media is everything, but even pre-social media with the message boards where you're able to show like, right. hey, look at this technique I use. Um, now a million people see it and that, uh, you know, 10 years later, everyone's doing it because yeah. they realize that it can be done. And there's so many different little techniques and different, you know, whether it's welding or, or, um, or painting or whatever, right. there's these new things that have come arise because they were just isolated and now we can connect with each other and, and. Perfect example today. I just found out that there's three phase welders. There's three phase MIG welders and I just used one. I, I didn't even know that that was the thing. I thought, I thought all welders were single phase. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah, we I, use, I, use, I use a, like a Pulse, I think yep. it was, Fronius, and I was just like, this is amazing. I use that stuff all the time because yeah. uh, my day job is building prototype military vehicles, so we're welding stuff from like two to four inches thick, and we do a ton of Pulse welding. Wow. When I first started doing it, I hated it. I was like, yeah, this is stupid, and then you get used to it, and it's like, there's even an art to this. Like, there's mm -hmm. even something that's, you know, welding, I love, I love welding. Welding's my passion, no matter what the process, what the, whatever, and uh I've learned to appreciate each one for what it is. Like yeah. even even now, as we're getting into, you know, friction stir and uh, different types of bonding, and uh, like, it, some of it isn't as as exciting to me, but it's still like, how wild is we're taking metals and just combining them and they're becoming one piece, you yeah. know, and yeah. coming up with new and more efficient ways to do it. Yeah, and, you know, like these are everyone has an arm here. It seems at the at, at Fabtech you know, this year, and um, there is a really cool uh, artist out of uh, Europe. He's actually built a bridge out of just complete weldment with using robotic arms. He really? built a bridge. I'll show you later. It's right insane. On. But yeah, and it's beautiful because it's CAD design and it's super organic looking and very like elegantly designed. But all it is is just a robot just depositing weld. So it's additive. And, like yeah, it's additive technology, 100%. But there's like zero waste as far as like, you know, yep. off cuts and stuff. I'm sure it, it tr took a tremendous amount of energy to do it. But uh, but the pro but the process and the product is like is just out of this world, man. It's exploded too because like ten years ago, three D printing wasn't really attainable by everyone. Now, like if you want one, you can have one in your living room, you know. <clears throat> and it's only going to keep getting crazier and crazier. Right. So that that's it, like in rapid prototyping and and um, design phases, it's like now you can have this real thing in front of you for, for scale for uh, you know 
something tangible to look at yeah. um, very quickly. Or like what you were talking about, making parts. Like, that's bananas. Or augmented reality. We go back to augmented reality. Um, uh, so Christian Sosa, a friend of mine, he's, he's, he was kind of like from the old guard where, he, you know, everything's made by hand, no computers. And, uh, you know, in the past few years, he's been getting into using technology and using computers. He came over to my shop the other day and he showed me a, a table he designed on his iPad. And he, it augments your reality by holding up the, uh, the iPad in, you know, in front of you and it'll project, it'll project the part or his where chair it where it is in the room. And you just like, you can walk around oh, it cool. by using, like you're looking in, through a window at right. the part sitting in, in the, your physical space. Like that type of stuff is amazing. Well, now people are doing their designing in like in those spaces. So you can have a designer in Europe and a designer in York and a designer in you know London, New York, wherever. And they're all like hands on on this project that's like in front of them. Yeah. And, you, yeah. you know, and, you know, another great thing about the technology is, um, you know, you can design something virtually and you want to work in Europe. You just shoot your files in Europe, get in a plane, go over there and find someone that has a machine shop and you produce your parts there versus old school, produce it in the States, Shipping put it on it a over. boat, yep. extremely expensive, you know. So yeah, but going back to pre-technology, and I was, talking to this, I was talking to Ivan about this the other day, it's just like there's so much value, the further we get away from making things by hand, the people that are still keep, you know, keeping the light on in terms of like you know, doing things the old school way, they just get they just get better and better because you go back and you're like wow you can do that without all of this stuff and it's just like so amazing that's that's why I really appreciate like World War Two planes it's like yeah how how did they like or the SR seventy one it's like that was like pre computers and it's Yo, like the math the math the the brain capacity to make out some of those equations yeah. to do yeah. those bends and just the stress testing and yeah pretty uh, amazing yeah I really uh. There's a, actually, there's a really good podcast. Uh, it, the, the, the podcast overall is more of a car podcast. It's called Overcrest. But they did a segment on like Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works, and they interviewed different engineers, different pilots, different people who were in the programs. It's really fascinating, like uh, from a fabrication check standpoint. It out. Super yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't, I need, anything else you guys want to rap about? Like, I mean, it's just been a lot of really cool stuff. A lot of the craziest stuff that I've seen here it, or even heard of here is just like, there's stuff out there that's going on I didn't even realize. Like, obviously, everybody knows about laser cutting. Sure, it goes way back. But I learned about a laser welder, yeah. which I did not know was a thing. And it's just, it's like a wire, fe wire feed, but instead of having an electrical arc to initiate and melt the puddle, melt the, the two parent materials together, it's just using a beam of light. And it's like... Why? But it, also cool. It's a game changer for, <laughs> for sheet metal, more. and yeah, it's yeah. it's 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 a really. She, Darla tried it last year. She did a little manual laser welding, and yes, yeah, and that's crazy, and that's cool, and I didn't even know that was a thing, and now I'm curious about it. So it's the same thing. It's like, it's like when it comes to, to you know what we're talking about with technologies and what you use. If you use something like that, that's you know brand new on the market, like does that make you not as good of a welder as somebody who uses right. a MIG welder or a TIG welder? Like it's ridiculous. And, and forty years ago, forty years from now, somebody's going to be like, "Back yeah. in my day, we laser <laughs> welded everything <laughs> using these yeah. protons exactly. and neutrons." Exactly. Yeah. And and at this also when it comes to like technology and where things can intersect for for anybody. For me, you know, for example, like I like to do a lot of stuff by hand, but I still use a plasma cutter for making certain components just to get the job done faster. I'm just doing repetitive work. But at the same time, I recently had Luis do a 3D model for me in a computer. And what I'm able to do with that is even though I'm going to build this thing, and even though it was just off the sketch that I drew for him, like by being able to make that 3D model, then I can take that to people who don't have an eye for art. And I can say, hey, can you make this? this is how much money that you have. Here's what I can give you. And they can look at it in a three-dimensional space where it would actually be sitting. So now they, they can go... Oh, that's what it's going to look like. Gotcha. You could tell me that till you're blue in the face, but I'd never be able to see it. But we're also not going to give you a bunch of money and just wait till it's done to see it. So totally. being able to do that, that's a huge advantage. And like, I never even would have thought of that as something I could do before, you know, meeting and talking to Luis and like it just the, the stuff that he can do. And with the model, like yeah. you put it into that space and it's like, okay, proportionally, maybe it needs to be a little bit bigger. Maybe exactly. It needs to be a little and you smaller. can change those things to get it where you want it. And then you know that. Yeah. And you're not just going like, okay, I'm going to start making this and then, oh, well, that didn't work. Let me redo this. So let me do that again. You can. Yeah. yeah. And also, like he's saying with uh, 
yeah, just with the ability to even scale things and look at things, to be able to interact with something. Like, even if you did want to just make it by hand, there's still there's huge advantages to technology, and it doesn't make yeah. any sense to avoid that. And there's, there's nothing that makes you better or worse what you do because of that. And so, that's, yeah, just all going back to that. But that model is just like, Mwah. Right on. Right. There's, yeah. there's also mm. the mixing of old and new. Like, I just found out about Ron Covell. Oh yeah. Ron yep. oh yeah i was like how Legend. do i not know about ron covell he's, you've seen, the cool, he's you've seen the bikes he's a super bikes cool guy you know? yeah anyway uh, i was watching because i'm really interested in learning how to do a thinner metal shaping i've been doing a lot of studying so i've been watching a lot of his stuff and he makes a lot of um he hammer forms some some yep. of his stuff and he makes these like kind of like really time consuming bucks and like you know hammer hammer forms out of wood and i'm here at fabtech and i just saw a five by ten uh router that can that can like plunge the z-axis can plunge like four inches and i'm like you can make those bucks. you can make those bucks like <laughs> yeah. very accurately and just hammer your aluminum sheets over it and it's just like that's a perfect mix of like the old and new which i think is super cool i've wanted to do that since a few fab techs ago and the money like i i still not sure i gotta get to the point where well anyways what it was was uh, i had hexagon scan one of my sculptures and i want to 3d print it and then use that as a mold to cast it in bronze so that's my my way of like wanting to you know join the old and the new kind yeah, of way yeah, of doing that's things. That's a great idea. I haven't done it yet, but that that's something that I've I've wanted to do. Uh, super cool. What about you, Frank? What have you seen here? <laughs> Y'all talking over my head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back to what I said earlier. I'm old school, and you know, for me, uh, art is just a passion. Yeah, I'm very passionate about what I do. I love what I do. I get to do it every day, you know. Nothing beats I, that. I have to sell enough to, to pay my bills, you know, and that's a goal, you know. So I need people that can connect to me and into, into, uh, however I do it, technology, no technology or whatever, but, you know, it feeds my soul, you know. For and sure. That, and that's just, I mean, that's a blessing. I get to do it every day, and I, I'm probably out in my studio about seven days a week. You know, and you're probably the same way. Yep, you know? yep, totally. But, I mean, like I said, no, ma no matter how you create it, you got to, you know, artists are going to, you know, it, Ivan's going to have his, his audience, Josh is going to have, you know, Lou's going to have, and I'm going to have my audience. So everybody's got their audience, you know, and that's what, that's what we, you know, to me, that's the, that's the important thing to me because I got to eat. You know, <laughs> yep. and if I don't have an audience, I'm not going to eat, you know, right on. I'm going to be doing something else. But yeah, like I said, you, I've, I've used technology. Um, I don't use it a lot, but I know that Lou and I talk about it all the time. I know the value of it, you know, and I think for Ivan, whatever works for him, whatever works for all of us, you know, but for me. You know, I, I'm. I like to keep it simple. I like to. I can appreciate. I like that. to ad lib. I, I, you know, I'm doing a piece now that I had just scrap metal, you know, laying against the wall for like a year and a half, and I, I saw something there, you know, and I'm like, I, I'm. I've never built something this big on speculation, you know. Right. And I, I said, I'm gonna do it. You know, I talked to yeah. Lou. I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this thing. So I got these plates and rolled them. You know, and just stuck them together. I had really no plan. I kind of had a plan, but I didn't have a plan. So this thing's eight foot diameter, twelve feet tall, and and then I just started filling in the blanks, and it's actually turning out pretty cool. Sometimes yeah. you gotta jump out of your comfort zone as an artist too, and then you really grow. You do so. You're like, I don't know about this, and then you jump yeah. into it, and it just opens up the snaps and start firing, and yeah. you know the creative juices start flowing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got a pile of scrap you know aluminum castings and i just look in my pile and you know i'm like i see one 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 little thing and i'm like okay that could be that and then you know you just start adding to it next thing you know you got something you know sure. at the end of the day you're like oh, where'd that come from you know <laughs> yeah. and that's the beauty of you know doing that's, art you it's know? a very free form free form process that i i no longer I, I, I could get into it, but I just don't work that way anymore. And it's it's not that I like see Frank and I'm like, wow, how can you how how could you even do that? But it's just like, I guess my point is is like you start getting too technology driven, and it becomes a crutch. Because where Frank is like, oh, I just see a bunch of material, I'm just gonna start building. I, like I always have to like start from drawings now. Like I always have to go to CAD and like define the space and get all my dimensions and then start. So going back to you know like it's not all about technology uh, you know being being able to free form something is a skill 
And, you know, not everyone has that. So I think it's really cool that you can do that, Frank. I'm definitely like, as much as I'm trying to embrace technology, I'm much more like when I work, I'm like Frank. Like I like to do the things with my hands. Everything's in my head. Yeah. Um, but the last couple of years, I have gotten to the point where it's like, all right, I want to try doing some, some different things. Um, but like at my, at my heart, I'm very much that, that same way. Like yeah. I really like just hammering, hammering stuff together until it looks like I want it to look, you know. Yeah, I'm even mixing wood and metal together, you know. I'm and depending on your process, for some people, that part of the process is so important to the final product. And for other people, that part of the process is like, oh, I got to get through this so that I can refine what I'm doing. So I guess it depends on the artist, too. Like some artists are, uh, they're going to create, they're going to create their style with technology and some, you know, that technology, if they try to integrate it, it would just change their, it would, yeah. it would change what they do. And you don't want to do that either. You got to experiment. I mean, you got to try stuff, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But that's the way you learn, you know. Yep, totally. Takes you to the next level. I look back at some of my early pieces, and I'm like, man, that's crappy, man. You know, <laughs> I did the same thing. And I can't believe somebody would even buy something like that. You know, <laughs> I was at I was at SEMA one year, and I had done a Cuda, a Plymouth Cuda sculpture, and I effing hated it. I had already like, I never redo anything, and I already redone it once, and I'm like, no, this sucks. And I was talking to somebody, I'm like. After the show, I'm taking this to work. I'm putting it in a four corner press and I'm freaking <laughs> crunching it. As I'm saying this, this guy walks up and he's like, Hey, uh, I'll give you, a, I can't, it was like $600. I'm like, yeah. He's like, I'll give you $600 for that. And I'm, I almost didn't want to sell it to him. I was so yeah. like, Oh, okay, here you go. You didn't and, want it to live? Yeah, I know, yeah. right? Been there. Like, yeah. Somebody liked it, but I didn't yeah. like it. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, no, that's wife, got my name my on it. You cannot buy it. Yeah. It will die. Scratch off yeah. the. Oh, yeah, I've been there. I'll yeah. do things. We my wife will walk out there and she'll like, what is that? And I'm, that's horrible. That is, that's, that is horrible. So I did this piece. This, I had this crazy thing that I did. I won't even go into what it was. But I, I did it, and she's like, that's, a, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. That's my quality control right there is my <laughs> and, wife. <laughs> and so about three weeks later, I was sitting in the corner in my gallery, and, and this, this guy comes in. I, he had bought some of my art. <laughs> And he comes in, you know, and he said, I was just in the area. I thought I'd stop by and see what's going on. So I gave him the whole tour. I always take people into the shop. This is what I'm working on. Go around, you know. And when he walked in the door, he looked, He saw that piece sitting there, you know. And I'm, and um, then we did the whole tour. And he came back and he said, Dadgum, I knew I shouldn't have stopped by here. I, I knew I'd have to have something. And I knew what he was going to say. He said, I want that. How much is it? And I threw him a crazy number, and he bought it. That's the best. That's the and best And I took feeling. that check in the house, and I laid it on the counter. And I said, <laughs> check that out, Terry. And she's like, oh, what is that for? I said, it was, that's for that stupid thing you said I would never you sell. You are fired for quality control. <laughs> so, yay for me. It was a victory. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, that's awesome. Well, yeah. even with like the what I was going to say earlier is even with the free form, like, letting something build itself, because that's definitely a way that I'll work, is you come up with, I'll start with an idea, like without a full drawing, and then just like take that idea and let it build itself piece by piece. So like Frank a lot more in that regard. But one of the things that I did want to say um, that Luis didn't necessarily touch on, but I've actually, even if you're doing that from the sculpture standpoint and that gets you a different result, I've watched him do that on the computer. So even though you're building with a computer instead of building with metal right off the bat, it's like, here's where I started. And you'll send me a picture of that because we always text them back and forth and keep them in touch. So it's like, hey, I even checked this out. And I'm like, awesome. And then send me another picture. Hey, check this out. And they see where it's changed and how it's evolved because he's still letting it build itself, but letting it build itself just through like, I don't like that. I like this. I'm going to change that. I'm going to change this. And we're doing that too when we're building a sculpture that way, but doing it by like, you know, cutting things apart and putting them back together. But you still, it's the same thing. That design process is still happening until it is what you yeah. want it to be. And I honestly think also, like, one of the things that's so beautiful about your work in particular, Luis, is the fact that, like, you're, like, using the technology to create the things that you're creating. So all these angles, all these forms, all these ways of creating, like, not just the, you know, the structure of how you're making it, but also, like, like within that, finding organic forms and still, like, coming up with edges and all this stuff. I don't know, man. I, I just... I'm floored by your work. I'm floored by the way that you start from nothing and build it into what it is, even if that's on a screen before you ever touch it to steal. If anything, it's just, yeah. 
I appreciate that, man. Yeah, Thank you. My mind, Especially man. coming from you. <laughs> Beautiful artist. Um, yeah, I, you know, going back to, you know, making things using the technology, it's like everything looks very perfect on the computer, but it's never that perfect when you actually go to like produce things because you may not be that great of a welder or you may not, whatever it might be, you may bend something in slightly incorrectly. So you always get these kind of like um, inconsistencies in the part that I think are just become part of the the character of the part but i also think that for instance i just made this uh um ivan hooked me up with a rope uh, rope uh, battle bot team on the discovery channel and they they needed me to make they were going to have this skin cast out of magnesium which i thought was insane <laughs> yeah they had some crazy sponsorship it was really cool but um the the company that was going to cast the part fell through or something so i ended up making like a laminated version of the part and we were looking at it on, on, on the computer and it looked super slick and, it, and you know, I, it was a very organic design. But I ended up laminating it and welding the, the, the crap out of it. And, and it took on, it's a whole different like look. It didn't even look like anything was on the computer other than just the overall shape. So it, it just took off. And that, that's what I really appreciate is when you see something on the computer, you make it physically, you make it physically but what you do by hand is going to Create. It's imbuing a character. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, you're still exactly. giving it a soul. Yeah, oh, I get that. Yeah. Totally. Super cool. We got stuff to do. So I want to thank Ivan and Frank and Lewis for yeah. coming by and, and doing this podcast with me. It's been a blast. Totally off the cuff. But hopefully you all enjoyed it. I know it's like four wildly different perspectives, but all kind of of the same soul when it comes to creating things. So um, thanks for joining us and uh, peace. Peace.